Good evening and welcome to the third night of our mission. Yeah, we're pleased that you're able to come back and join us once again. Yeah, for those who have not been with us for the entire mission, yeah, just a little background on the format and how things work here. Yeah, I think everyone knows we've got restrooms back there and through the side door over here. Yeah, should you need them, and feel free to use them when you need them. Yeah, we also yeah, then will have will continue with the format that we have been using. There, that's better. Yeah, we'll continue with the format that will expose the Blessed Sacrament. And after a brief period of silence, Father Kalish will have some extended preaching for us. After his preaching, yeah, yeah, we'll have some organ, organ music playing during your uh, time of prayer and meditation. During all of that time, should you desire, priests are available for confession. Even Father Kalish assured me he will not be offended if you get up in the middle of his homily and go to confession. As a matter of fact, he said he would be especially thrilled that, to know that he, was being, that he was motivating you. But priests will be available for confession. This evening we have yeah, Father Vallalonga, will be in the confessional, the, enter through that side and go around to the priest's sacristy in the middle. Father George Needif will be in the, sac, the altar server's sacristy over on this side. After he's finished preaching, Father Kalish will be back in the regular confessional. We, yeah, I, I'll be over on this side confessional and uh, Father Penn from Ravenswood said he will be joining us right about the time the preaching is finished. He'll be in this confessional over here. This evening, we do have a little added bonus for you. For those you know, who stick around all the way through the end, after the Blessed Sacrament is reposed, Father Kalish will yeah, have a special mission blessing, yeah, and he'll explain that a little bit more yeah, as, he, yeah, as part of his talk. But yeah, the, the mission ble blessing yeah, carries with it a plenary indulgence. Yeah, so, yeah, and he'll be doing that. Yeah, he has not only his crucifix, but he has with that a, a relic from the true cross. So, yeah, we have, like I said, we have a little extra special blessing this evening. If you are not familiar with the music and prayers for Eucharistic adoration, you can find them on the inside back cover of the Missalette. That's the skinny book that's of the two in your pews. And we'll begin, I shall go get the Blessed Sacrament and expose for our beginning. Down in Ador. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. My bad. My bad. Oh, saving victim, open wide the gate of him to us below. Our foes press on from every side. Thine aid supply thy strength bestow. To your great name be endless praise. Him 
art, O God, head one in three. O grant us endless length of days in our true native land with thee.
In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for joining us this night here to this church, St. Francis Savior. We pray in a particular way for all that you wish to give us, all those intentions that we carry with us, all those who have asked our prayers, all those that we might think about tonight during this mission or in the coming days, those we may hear about who need our prayers. We ask in advance for the graces that you wish to give them and all those joining us or who might watch this later on YouTube, we pray for them too. Lord God, give us courage, give us generosity, give us patience to embrace the crosses in our lives, to carry them even with joy, even with serenity as they come our way and to assist those we accompany who are carrying their crosses or who are on the cross. Give us the words of strength to be with them in that time as we accompany your son these final days of Lent. We ask for the grace to accompany him also with that joyful knowledge of his love in our lives and of the power and the beauty of the resurrection. We say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, <clears throat> now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The way of the cross which is the mission of our lives, which is your vocation, my vocation, those things that we're called to do and live and become, which always takes its form as cruciform, because that's how God chose to redeem the world and the way in which we too will be redeemed that way of the cross, the mission of our lives, the vocation, the things that we are called to do requires love, courage, generosity, and patience. We've been speaking about relationship, our relationship with the Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gives us our identity as beloved sons and daughters of our Lord, we first receive it in baptism, the greater outpouring and confirmation, even greater conformity uh, in the sacraments of service, which are matrimony, ordination, that identity. And from that, and living in that proper order, relationship to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, recognizing and knowing and living your identity as a beloved son or daughter with a particular conformity, that conformity then becomes your mission. A mission in life. To lay down your life for your spouse in good times and bad and sickness and health, for wealth or poverty. And that particular mission you might have with your children or grandchildren, with your work, with your dedication and other ways that are revealed to you. We spoke about 10 years ago, Pope Francis told us to give up mediocrity and that sometimes we ask for patience because God isn't finished with us yet and he still isn't finished with us yet. And yet how our Lord sees and is moved by us. He himself, in a surprising way, has an encounter with us as we seek to have an encounter with him. That relationship of discipleship, that moment, even tonight, that gives your life, my life, a new horizon, a decisive direction by meeting the Lord Jesus. I spoke to you about uh, the sister, Dominican sister who I met and how uh, just only last month, I reconnected with her, and I've had the privilege of saying two masses in her family apartment. She's an only child, 
and she's accompanying with her mother their father, her father, who is dying. And uh, how joyful it was for me to be able, those moments, to converse with, with him, with Fred. Well, the last time I saw her, the second time I had Mass, you know, we walked out together, and I said, Sister, how are you doing? And, um, you know, she related, she said, you know, I was angry with him today, not her father, but God the Father. She said, I told him, I should be happy that for the second time Mass is being said for my dad, with my dad here, but I just wish he was healed or it was over. And maybe, maybe you're like that. When the cross is there, we wish it was over or done. We're taken away, right? But that's not what the cross is. <laughs> the cross is given to us for a particular time and we never ask for it. But when it's there, we can respond to it. It's the only thing we can control. I told you about a student of mine, Katie Karras, who 10 years ago this, uh, this month reached out to me in a Facebook message and recognizing that she was back under the cross. Her childhood cancer came back. She had taken a year off from medical school. Father, please, now is the time to rally prayers for me. That was about all she could ask for. And so many did pray in her last days and hours of her life. You know, she had told the doctors and her family that she asked me to do her funeral. So after she passed, you know, um, I flew to Chicago. And I can still remember that Sunday night, driving in a rental car. I had the address. I, I parked a few spaces away from the house, and I just sat there. What, what, I didn't want to go in the house. What, what could anyone say? to comfort them, console them. I did go in and uh, met mom and dad, her brother who I knew, and her aunt. And we, we spoke about Katie and we had some pizza and beer. And then we prepared the funeral. The cross requires love, courage, generosity, and patience. I told you yesterday about Blessed Michael McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus, and how, in his own words, the most difficult moment of his life was going to be to accompany this young man, 21-year-old Chip Smith, who was about to be executed, and whom Blessed Michael had tirelessly sought to bring to God's mercy, and by the grace of God had done so and then was charged with preparing him spiritually for the moment of his hanging. And how he asked for prayers, saying, we, not just this young man, but we, we ask for prayers. And if I could be at anywhere but here next week at this hour, please. But I know it's my duty to accompany this young man, and he did. He did. We know in the Garden of Gethsemane, our Lord sweated blood. Father, if this chalice, if this cup pass, but not my will be done, but your will be done. The cross requires love, courage, generosity, and patience on our part. Father Bohomas, Ukrainian Greek Catholic priest, behind Russian enemy lines, I ask myself, what was my identity? What should I do? And then he went about doing it. John Paul II said that where the cross is raised, there begins the new evangelization. There begins the good news of the gospel when the cross is raised. And not simply in our churches, but in reality, in our lives, where the cross is raised, that specter, there begins the new evangelization. How can we say that? We can say that because, as we heard, the name of God, remember, given to Moses, still good today, 
I am who am with you, is the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we call upon Him, when we receive, even in obedience, and we adhere to the reality in front of us, then, then we realize we're not the Savior. We realize our lives are not simply our own. We're not saved by ourselves. We're part of the body of Christ, suffering. We seek the Lord in a new way. And then we allow ourselves in humility, allow God to enter in to show us the way. During daily Mass this week, I shared with some people here about um, my goddaughter, baby Josephina. So my cousins, Jay and Jennifer, two years ago now, uh, asked me to be the godfather of their second child. And she was born in, with a, a peculiar condition uh, that is always fatal. We didn't know it until she was born, that her blood refused to carry oxygen through her body. And so they were still testing her to find out what was wrong when she was baptized. And then uh, the hospital chaplain in New Jersey visited them and brought communion to my, to my cousin, the mother, on a Sunday, the day she was born, and, and told the parents, my cousins, he said, pray that you know the mission of your daughter's life. Pray that you know the mission of your daughter's life. Remember, we say God has hopes for us. Our lives are not finished. Please be patient with me. You know, my cousins, uh, they're, they're very faithful, and um, they, they went through this cross. They embraced it, and they embraced giving their daughter back without possessing her to the Heavenly Father. And she died after eight days. But that mission of her life, they said to me, you know, every parent would want to be present to their child at all the most important moments of their lives. And we, we had the privilege to be present to our daughter for her whole life. What a gift. And they received it as a gift, that cross. I want to tell you about a friend of mine who I'm just amazed by him and, and, uh, his name is Yuri. Yuri's a brother knight at Columbus. Yuri uh, wanted to be a priest, uh, and he studied for the priesthood, but he, he met his wife, and so he discerned out and discerned marriage. He's happily married. He's got two children. He's a small business owner uh, in Ukraine. They make uh, the, the tops for, like, jelly jars and for pasta jars and canning and all the rest. And uh, the war broke out, and he's the head of the Knights of Columbus in Ukraine. And uh, one thing we can do, we're taking up a collection again for the end of the mission. The money will go to the Ukraine Solidarity Fund. So I, I appreciate your generosity in, in listening to these, but also thinking about how to support them. One thing is to buy Ukrainian. They're still paying people. They still have jobs, but people don't buy Ukrainian. And so one way to support them long-term, if you're a business owner, try to buy Ukrainian goods. You know, Ukrainian companies or place orders. My friend Yuri said that uh, there's some companies that uh, they, they can't fulfill. Some of their uh, plants are under occupation, so they can't make all the orders. But there's some companies that are placing orders now for when there's peace. And it helps them pay the bills. He has 150 employees. He's got to pay them so that they can survive too. So that's what he's doing. As He's a dad. He's a father. He's living his faith as a brother knight. And uh, now he's basically in charge of distributing all the amazing aid that comes over uh, to Ukraine. I, I just got pictures yesterday of a bunch of teenage children who received wheelchairs for the first time. They were injured by shrapnel or by buildings falling upon them for the Russian bombs. They had no wheelchairs. And so the money that people gave uh, was able to buy for only $150, they could have a wheelchair. Changes their life. They get mobility now, right? So, um, you know, my, my Christmas card this year has a picture of uh, the Coats for Kids program that Yuri and the Brother Knights do there. 
and uh, I asked him, Riri, can I, can I use this picture? It's a picture of him putting on a, a coat on three, three children. And, and he said, Father, I had tears in my eyes when that picture was taken. He said, uh, in Ukraine, we give the coats to those who have lost fathers in the war. And we don't only give them a coat, but we, we give them a hug. And we, we tell them that, that their identity is the son or a daughter of God. And we want to show them what real fatherhood is like. It's not what the Russians are saying. It's what we're showing them as brother knights. You know, so, so Yuri, uh, if he, I, I send them these videos. So Yuri, if you're watching, uh, I'm praying for you. And, and I hope you have a church here. I know you do of, in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Praying for you, for your courage for your strength, for your generosity and patience, right? We don't choose the cross. You didn't choose to live in a country occupied and under war. And, you know, sometimes I text him at night and, and he's up. And then I look at the news and, oh, yeah, his part of the country, the, the Russians had just sent some bombs over. So he's in a bomb shelter. We don't choose that. But we do choose how we respond you know, there's a, another group uh, there in Ukraine. I told you last night about the orphans that made their way to Poland. Well, about the bikes and some of them who uh, just really had grown up without a, a real knowledge of God's generosity and love in their lives. Well, this particular orphanage, it was, it was two joint orphanages. And the day the war began, there were 100 orphans in it in Ukraine. And uh, they were up near... Um, Chernobyl, which was where the Russians were coming down and attacking from. And uh, there were 50 staff members for the 100 orphans. The day the war began, only five staff showed up. The other 45, well, the war began. They probably had other things to do, but they didn't show up to their work, which was caring for these children, including children who were disabled and all under 18, including young children. And luckily, those five people that showed up, they were teachers, and they had a choice. Love requires courage, generosity, and patience. And after two days, they kept showing up, and the director was there, and she said, pack, children, pack your bags. We're going on a day trip for two days. And she was calling ahead. And she managed to evacuate them to the west of Ukraine. And then they, Catholic Charities in Czestochowa, Poland, had a retreat center, I told you, very beautiful. And they had plenty of rooms. And just last week, we celebrated the second year of that orphanage there, now in this retreat center in Poland, still only with those five teachers who left everything else behind, the cross, we don't choose it. We simply choose how we respond with courage, generosity, patience, love. You know, Father and I last night, um, we watched a film that I would ask everyone to try to watch. It just won the Academy Award for Best D Documentary. Maybe you heard of it. It's called 20 Days in Mariupol which is the name of Mar Mary's city in Ukraine. And it's a documentary by Mistav Chernov. He's a, a, a press person, and he spent 20 days in the city of Mariupol, gradually as the Russian from the first day of the war until the 20th, as the Russian troops attacked the city and began to surround it, and then did surround it. And he miraculously, with the help of a policeman, uh, got out, but more importantly, got the footage out. And so, so much of the footage of the war, of their bombing maternity homes and killing civilians, he recorded. And without uh, extraordinary efforts, risking his life of courage, patience, generosity, um, the world would not have known the crimes that were committed and what happened. You can watch this for free. It's actually just it's on YouTube or on PBS, 20 Days in Mariupol. I, I really strongly advise everyone to watch it because 
part of our understanding is, is important. What's actually happening? And you'll see the cross. And you'll see how love requires courage, generosity, and patience. They quote a doctor in that film who says that during war, it's like the x-ray. He's like, where you see everyone's insides. Those who are good become better. Those who are evil become worse. And you see that. We're talking about this really important principle, the generosity of love. The Czech priest, Thomas Halik, reminds us that love without patience is not true love. Hope without patience is not true hope. Faith without patience when in the darkest hour of trial and struggle is simply not mature or deep enough to carry you through, to carry your cross. We're called tonight, as we listen to these and pray before our Eucharistic Lord, to pray that we would be freed from a superficial faith that would want to avoid the cross as hard as it might be. Remember the words of our Lord on the last night to those who would follow him. John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am who am with you. I am the vine, the true vine. And my father, he is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that bears no fruit, he cuts away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes to make it bear even more. Then our Lord says, you are pruned already by means of these words that I have spoken to you. Make your home in me as I make mine in you. He goes on to say, no man, a man can have no greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends. I call you friends because I have told you everything I have learned from my Father, including the cross, which will be revealed the next day. Remember that. When we bear fruit, the Father, who is the gardener, He comes and eclipses us. That's the cross. It arises in your life. Why? So that you can have a more deeper faith. Why? So that you can believe in the darkest hours of trial that come in your life. Like my friend, sister, who says, I just wish this was over or the cross was taken away. Yes, we know that. She's being pruned. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch he be that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear even more fruit. I want to share with you a beautiful story, and their photo is on the handout for today, about the Ulma family of Markova. The husband, Joseph, who was 44, and his wife, Victoria, who was 32. They're farmers. They lived uh, at a time of occupied Poland, occupied by the Nazi Germans, who, in only in Poland, had said that issued an edict that any Pole found hiding Jews or a Jewish family, and this only was in Poland, no other country that was occupied by them did they pass this law, any Pole found hiding a Jew or a Jewish family would be immediately killed. No questions asked. And so Joseph and his wife, Victoria, they were farmers. She actually went to college in the 1930s. Remarkable woman. She had seven children at the age of 32. And Joseph was an incredible man, faith-filled farmer, 
Um, he installed one of the first light bulbs in his village, in his house, so that he could read to his family at night, often from the Bible, but other works as well. And like your pastor, he was a great photographer. He loved taking pictures. In the 1930s, he had an amateur camera. And all the photos of their family, which we have plenty of, almost all of them were taken by him, of his own children and his own wife. Well, they too attended parish missions like you are. They too prepared uh, for Lent and for Easter and the Triduum. And it's said that they were often uh, the, the, the most frequent parishioners in their village church. Okay, very faithful. And as I said, they also read the scriptures. And we have their family Bible. And next to the passage of the Good Samaritan, who is your neighbor, right? The man who stops and helps. They handwrote in their Bible, hand wrote, yes, with an exclamation point. They knew the gospel. They knew that the cross requires courage, generosity, patience, love. And when the Jews were rounded up and several families came seeking refuge on their farm, they said yes. And they hid them. Some of them were hiding outside in, a, in like a dugout in the farm. And then those moved on. And then there were eight Jews from two different families. And they lived sort of like in a false attic above the house. And they didn't simply stay there. They worked with the family to make money. They helped. And coming up next week, March 24th, 80 years ago, 1944, a neighbor betrayed them, said, you know the Olmas? They're hiding Jews. Knowing that was a death sentence, not only for the Jews, but for the Poles who were hiding them. And so in the early hour mornings of March 24th, early hours of the morning, the Gestapo came, they surrounded the farm, they found the Jews hiding, they immediately killed them, there's a description of blood dripping from the attic, falling onto a family photo on the table. And then they waited for all the rest of the town to come. They called all the neighbors, come, come to the Ulma farm. And in the morning, in front of all their neighbors, they killed Joseph, 44. They killed his wife, Victoria, who was 32. And then one of the guards, in a rather flippant way or certainly a very evil way. Oh, we won't bother you with the children. And so they killed Stanislava. She was the oldest at seven. And they killed her, her sister, Basha, or Barbara, six and a half. And they came to their oldest brother, Vladislav, who was five and a half. And they killed him too. Then they martyred Franciszek, who was almost four years old. And there was little Anthony, he was almost about three, and he too was martyred. And Maria was one and a half years old, and they killed her too, the German Nazis. Full of evil. And at the time of the deaths and, and the, the chaos, Victoria was pregnant, and likely the stress and all of that, she began to give birth to the baby in her womb, and they killed that baby too. Remember, they knew what they were doing. They had read the passage of the Good Samaritan. They had said yes. To be a Christian requires courage, generosity, patience, love. They knew God, Yahweh, I am who am with you. They understood that. They knew it. And the day came when they paid the price for that. Sadly. 80 years ago next week, I invite you to pray the prayer, especially in the leading next days, because they were just beatified. They're the only family that we know of that was ever beatified together as a family this past September. We can pray to all of them and ask their intercession and their prayers for your loved ones, for your needs and attention. So I give you their prayer for canonization there on the handout. You know, during this time 
John Paul II was not yet um, Pope, or of course, so he, his name was Carol Wojtyla. Young Carol was studying uh, kind of in the underground uh, school while he was forced to work by the German Nazis. And he himself said, you know, at this time under the Nazi occupation, all the best people of my generation, like the presidents, the captains of the team, the people you would look to, the Grand Knights that you would follow, all of them had already been arrested, sent to prison, to the concentration camp, or killed. And so he says, it provoked in me a question. What about me? What about my life? What am I called to do? How will I respond? And that's when he opened himself and began to think about the priesthood. And he applied and was accepted into the underground seminary and began that path, that cross, which we know he died, you know, uh, coming up also in April 2005. Again, we're, we're speaking here about the cross in our lives. St. Joseph, Pope Francis says, shows us that we are called to trust in God because he always finds a way. God always finds a way. Even amidst the difficulties, even amidst the crosses, the fear, the, you know, you name it. How do you get out of Mariupol? How, how do you ha have a business and, and serve the knights in Ukraine? How do you carry on when your daughter is dying as my cousins, or when your father is dying as sister is experiencing? Or how do you accompany someone who's just lost a loved one? Pope Francis says, St. Joseph's trust, trust is the way. Trust that God always, as he says, is there ahead of time. He's there at the place where we're going to get to before we even start out on the journey. El nos primera. God is always there first. And when we arrive on the cross, under the cross, with those carrying their cross, when we get there, there. There we meet the Heavenly Father. There. There. That relationship comes to its fruition. Our identity as beloved sons, beloved daughters. The final story is that, again, of John Paul II. You might remember when President Reagan uh, spoke on June 12, 1987, at the Berlin Wall and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. At that same day in God's providence, now John Paul II was back in Poland, his home country, still under martial law, still under communist totalitarian domination, with no hope uh, that that would go away within two years. And he went, he gathered the young people of Poland who were in need of hope, and he brought them to the place where World War II began. It's up in the north on the Baltic Sea near Gdańsk, a place called Westerplatte. Westerplatte, on September 1st, 1939, there was a garrison of 200 Polish soldiers who were there to defend that part of Poland with the orders to hold out for six hours if they came under attack. And in the early hours of the morning, what looked like a German cruise ship unveiled itself. It was a warship, opened up its guns on Westerplatte. They sent the Luftwaffe over bombing uh, the, the fort and they sent 2,000 Kriegsmarine to storm it. And those uh, 200 Polish soldiers, they held out those six hours. They lasted the first day, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth day. They took 50% casualties. They were down to 100. Uh, they were almost out of ammunition, and so they did finally surrender. Uh, tragically for them, uh, they were not treated as prisoners of war. According to the Geneva Convention, they were sent to the concentration camps where almost all of them died in that horrific manner. So John Paul II brings young people who are seemingly without hope, living in a communist society, 
still under martial law, he brings them to that spot. And he says this speech, part of which I give you there. He says, even if others do not demand much from you, you must demand for yourselves. Each one of you will find in your own life your own vesture plot. And he called it a task you must assume and complete some just cause in which it is impossible not to fight, some duty, some obligation from which you cannot escape and from which it is impossible to desert. A certain order of truths and values you are obliged to maintain and defend. In such a moment, and he says, and there are many of them, for they are not something ex exceptional. Remember, Christ is passing you by and saying, follow me. Do not abandon him. Do not run away. Hear that call. This speech in, certain, in the Catholic world is probably as famous as the Reagan speech. I give it to you to reflect on and pray with. Because despite the drama, the setting, of course, these young people, within two years, they would be tasked with voting and living in a free country, thanks be to God. But the Holy Father reminds us that these are not exceptional moments. They might be at the end of our lives, accompanying your husband or your father, or watching your child die, or sacrificing your life for others. But there are also many other times that are not as exceptional. The day in and the day out, the drudgery accompanying your spouse with love, which requires courage, generosity, and patience. Serving them, caring for them, helping them, Again, I think of sister. I think of her mother accompanying their father on his deathbed. I think of my friend Yuri in Ukraine rushing to get wheelchairs or coats or food packages to those most in need while still doing his job, still paying his employees a wage so that they too can survive. We have no greater love than to lay down our lives, our Lord tells us. Blessed Joseph and Victoria and the whole Ulma family, they understood that. They lived that. We can ask their intercession when the cross comes in our lives, that we too, we too would carry it, that we too would understand that the cross with patience is sweet. Let's pray tonight that you and I would have the ability to carry, carry the cross in our lives. The big ones and the little ones. The everyday ones that you can't escape. And the dramatic ones. Should we find ourselves like Wells Crowther, like Abby D'Agostino, that we would react in the way that we would want to when the war comes, when any war, spiritual, it's like an x-ray of your inside. Those who are good, those who carry the little crosses, they'll know how to carry the big ones too. At the end of the mission, after benediction tonight, if you can stay, I'll give you a special blessing with a relic of the true cross. And we're called to pray as we do that also an Apostles' Creed and Our Father and Hail Mary for Pope Francis' intentions to receive uh, that indulgence and to go to confession and communion within a week. I invite you to go to confession. We have extra priests here today. Be freed from your sins and look at Jesus and ask him for the graces, those graces John Paul had, those graces the Ulma family had, even the grace of Katie Karras, who died 10 years ago, even just to ask, to ask for prayers. 
Amen.
Down in adoration falling this great sacrament we hail. Over ancient truth, new rites of grace prevail. Faith will tell us Christ is present when our human senses fail. To the everlasting Father and the Son who made us free, and the Spirit God proceeding from them each eternally. Be salvation, honor, blessing, might, and endless majesty. Amen. You have given them bread from heaven. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave us the Eucharist as the memorial of your suffering and death. May our worship of this sacrament of your body and blood help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom where you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Please pray with me for the intentions of Pope Francis. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and then should come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, 
as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Now I invite you to think for a moment of someone you know who is deceased or for yourself for whom you wish to offer this indulgence. Heavenly Father, we pray that you receive this intention on our part, that you strengthen us to carry our cross, to live the life you call us to, and to enter into the holy weeks ahead with joy and with faith. And now to give the blessing with the crucifix and the relic of the true cross, the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our novena and our mission, our, our mission rather, is ended. Uh, go in peace. It's been a joy to be with you. I invite your prayers for my work with the Knights of Columbus and my preaching uh, around the country. And uh, I hope to be back one day in Parkersburg. So thanks for turning out and tuning in. Those of you watching online, you can share the videos with others uh, also for the graces that they need. God bless you. And please be generous towards Ukraine. The baskets are out as you leave, or you could uh, donate online as well to the Ukrainian Solidarity Fund. Thank you. And thank you, Father John. It has been a joy and a privilege to be with you. I look forward to seeing you again, well, soon, I'm sure. Yeah, hopefully maybe twice this year, if not more. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. thank you to all of you for yeah, joining us through these days. Please share for those who were not able to make it. Let them know that the videos remain on YouTube and they can be shared and watched freely. Thank you. God bless. Have a good night.